For Must Be Nice, this is Day by Day, the new series of stories inspired by our new normal. Today's episode is co-written by Victoria Negri and Chris Steele Nicholson and stars Madeline Arthur. This is There Is No Title For This Story Yet. There is no title for this story yet. I'm stuck inside my family's suburban house with ardent aspirations of not catching coronavirus. I'm sitting on my childhood bed, surrounded by items from my tween years. A lava lamp on the nightstand, textbooks I'll never open again, and photos from high school that I should probably retire. I start to write in my journal, but my mind wanders unable to concentrate on anything. I haven't gotten up in a while. Maybe I should just move for a bit. I climb out of bed and follow my cat down the hall. She's confused why I'm perpetually home right now. She hops up onto her favorite chair, and something outside catches her attention. I look to see what's excited her. Nothing seems to be out there. It's just the backyard. Yes, there it is. Yes, it's a mess. Something should be done about it, but I don't think I should address it now. No, not now. A moment somewhere else. The lighting changes. My feelings change. The location changes. There's the sound of gentle wind. Then a rush of wind, and then gentle again as I swing on the trapeze. Up here, but wanted down there. Gravity feels like a scolding mother. Come down here at this instant, she says, tugging impatiently. You'll catch a cold. But there's someone else on the other swing of the trapeze waiting to catch me. Looking at the backyard, still looking. Screw it, I'm going out there. I walk onto my back deck. I think about sweeping leaves away as a kid, building the deck with my father, and of the concrete steps that hide beneath from lives before my own. Fallen trees scatter the yard, just now waking up from winter, slightly dead and beginning to be overgrown. The first robins are staking out their territory. They stand imperiously looking around with a you want a piece of me attitude. (laughs) Seems like robins can be a little uptight. Maybe it's not viewed like that within the robin community. I look at the now filled in patch of dirt that served as home base for me and my siblings impromptu baseball games. My eyes track to the partial line of shrubs that separate my family's house from our neighbor. That yard and home held great mystery when I was a child. My neighbor Margaret lived there. How to describe Margaret? She was old, perpetually old, and rather scary. The kind of person that even as a 20-year-old must have looked weathered. I can't remember her ever showing joy, a rare look of contentment, but otherwise, the lines of her lips were stretched flat, perfectly parallel to the sky and ground. These baseball games were emotional outlets for other transgressions, so things could get punitive. I absolutely stole my sister's favorite graphic novel, then promptly left it on the school bus. She got revenge by blindsiding me as I rounded second. Instantly, I was on my back looking up at her, and the sun was directly over her shoulder, so I had to squint. I wondered if she planned that somehow. She stood imperiously looking down at me with that, you want a piece of me? attitude. It didn't end with the blindside. There was also probation. She chucked the ball into Margaret's yard and said, Go get it! I'll I'll probably just leave it, I said. Her eyes widened and fists tightened. I went to get the ball. I sprinted across Margaret's property like I was running on hot coals, sneaking glances toward her darkened windows all the while. 
I practiced what I was going to say if she emerged from her house and started yelling at me. Although, I felt it was more likely I'd see her standing there, behind a window, completely still, like a ghostly figure unable to leave. A moment somewhere else. The lighting changes. My feelings change. The location changes. There is the sound of gentle wind, then a rush of wind, then gentle wind again as I swing on the trapeze. I see the man. He is reaching out. Claps his hands together, which releases a cloud of white powder. He is counting down. Five. Four. Three. Two. My father would talk with Margaret every once in a while in her driveway, just as she was about to get into her black Cadillac. And I wonder what they could be talking about. I heard their murmurs and watched their gestures and would make up stories about what they were saying. I would whisper their dialogue to myself. Have you ever slapped a water buffalo? Of course, it was about this big. Did he get mad when you did that? Yes, of course. I watched as she shifted her weight in her awkward, bulky, therapeutic shoes, which helped ease the pressure of her uneven gait and further added to her mystery. It was as though I lived next door to the real-life version Phantom of the Opera. Margaret owned an antique store just a block away, and I'd walk past with my parents on evening strolls during the summer. Through the panes of old glass, one could see the museum-like interior, turn-of-the-century silver and things that people were barely interested in. It felt more like a storage house for Margaret's precious artifacts than a business. Even as a kid, it felt bizarre to me. Strange how her house was completely in ruin, yet by contrast, her garden was lush and well-tended. There were tomato plants, a lilac bush, a weeping willow tree, which I held a particular fondness for, and beautiful lilies lining her house. Winters found Margaret chipping away at ice on the front steps. My parents would watch her struggle and order one of us kids to go help. This was the closest we ever got to her. We'd timidly offer our services, only for her to hand us the shovel and quietly go inside. Her house's crumbling exterior made me wonder more what she was hiding behind its decaying facade. I spied on Margaret from my backyard as she spent hours on her knees in her garden, wearing oversized gardener's gloves and a big floppy hat that shielded her skin from the sun as she meticulously pruned and sheared away leaves and weeds. A moment somewhere else. The lighting changes. My feelings change. The location changes. The man finished the countdown and yells, One! I let go of the trapeze and float through the air. It works. The catcher catches me. Our hands grasp each other's forearms like we've been doing this forever. We are moving through the air together. Margaret rarely had guests over. Occasionally, we'd notice a visitor's car in her driveway, but they never stayed for long. Her husband passed away a while ago, and she lived in an existence of solitude, moving in between her house and the antique shop. I'd, I'd sometimes see her on her front porch, watching the robins eat bird seeds she left out for them. She was protective and seemed to care deeply for the things that were alive in her immediate vicinity yet still remain physically distant. She watched from afar like a character in a Hitchcock film. No, if only Hitchcock knew her, he'd cast her immediately. Years passed. 
hunched more than normal. Fewer cordial conversations with my father. Less rides out in her black Cadillac. A strange car in her driveway every once in a while. I'd ask my parents about it. Who do you think is visiting Margaret? My mother looked towards her house. Then at me and with a shrug, I'm not really sure. A terrible, record-breaking blizzard hit when I was 15, burying my neighborhood in four feet of snow. We all helped my father shovel out our driveway, barely able to keep up with the ever-growing mounds of powder. The next morning, I looked out the window and saw Margaret's driveway and walkway were still covered in snow. I was concerned. What if she had an emergency and needed to get out quickly? I went over there and felt nervous like a little kid again. I looked in a small window of her garage to see if her infamous black Cadillac was still there. Yep, she was home. Maybe she was napping, I thought. I walked up her icy steps to her front door. She had no doorbell, so I knocked. I waited. No answer. I began shoveling the driveway. Three hours later, I finished sweating beneath my winter coat and pants, my shoulder burning from heaving wet snow. And I started to return home when Margaret opened the door. Hello, she said. Was she watching me and for how long? Why didn't she open the door when I knocked? Whoa, she is a Hitchcock character. No problem, I responded, half looking at her. You'd like some money, right? That question made me feel uncomfortable. Um, no, no charge. <laughs> oh, really? Pro oh, bono. <laughs> she chuckled. Whoa, she chuckled. Okay, well, come here anyway. I walked to her front door with all the speed of a tired tortoise. Got something for you. Hang on. She turned to go into the house, and as she did, she tried to push the door shut. It didn't close completely and kicked back out a few inches. I couldn't resist. So in a moment of small personal bravery, I nudged the door a little further open and looked inside. A moment somewhere else. The lighting changes, my feelings change, the location changes. The man lets go, I let go, and I fall. I watch him get further away, he watches me. Old carpet lined the floor by the front door, more worn out where people traipsed off in. You could almost see the specificity of footfall in the fabric. I looked up from the carpet and into her house. Down the hall leading from the entrance was her kitchen. I could see part of a faded horse painted directly onto the wall. I heard Margaret shuffling through items and settling on something. A moment of calm. I stepped back from the doorway, preparing for her to reemerge from the hallway. Shuffling sounds, she reappeared, holding something and thrust it forward. Here you go, thanks for what you did. She closed the door. A moment somewhere else. The lighting changes, my feelings change, the location changes. Powder dust from a man's hands floats above. My empty trapeze still swings back and forth. I feel the net gently give way as I land. The goodbye was so abrupt, I was wondering if what just happened had really happened. I looked down at her offering. It was a photograph of my fourth birthday party. My parents rented ponies and invited all our friends over. In the photo, Margaret, dressed as a clown, led my horse by the reins. Her husband 
dressed as a lion tamer, walked next to me as I rode. I was smiling. They were smiling. I wore a pointy birthday hat and a glittery dress. My mother knocks on the glass of the back door and I'm violently torn from my memories. I wave to her. I can see her mouth. Dinner is in 10 minutes. I wave and say, okay. She retreats back into the kitchen. I look one more time to Margaret's yard and notice the changes our new neighbors have made to the house and property. Tomatoes and lilacs are gone, replaced by a patio and barbecue. The weeping willow tree is still there, but needs attention. And the lilies have been paved over by a wider driveway. The shrubs dividing our yards look like a lazy teenager's unkempt bedhead. The house, fully repaired, is now topped with an obnoxious satellite dish. The property has become a reversal of its former self. So much so that it feels like there are constant summer parties laughing and loud music as the smell of burgers on the grill wafts across our yard. Every weekend there are volleyball games and on the 4th of July, illegal fireworks crack and shower down sparks. I find myself missing the quiet existence of our former neighbor. The sun is going down and I walk back inside my house and go to my room. I search through my drawers and photo albums to find the photo tucked in an old book. I look up and out the window and notice a robin on a branch. I smile at him. He smiles back, then flits away. Dinner! My mother beckons. I put the photo back in the book and place it on the shelf. As I leave, I realize this story does have a title. It's called... Small personal bravery. The end. This episode was produced by myself, Adam Faze, and Jamie Dolan, with sound mixing and design by Beckett Cerny and an original score from Luca Closer. Special thanks to Christ Hanover for our very special animation. Before we end this episode, I want to take an opportunity to highlight a way you can help make an impact on those who need us most. Which is why I gave a call to my friends Maya and Alex Shibitani, the Olympic figure skating duo better known as the Shib Sibs, to talk about a fundraiser they started for Get Us PPE. Here's what they had to say. So, um, you know, when we found out that healthcare workers across the country and around the world, but specifically in the U.S., were in a precarious situation because of the lack of available personal protective equipment, uh, and that includes you know, things like respirators and gloves and masks, the things that keep them safe so they can protect themselves and treat patients uh, and then also keep their family safe. When we saw that, we knew that there was something that we wanted to do to help. So, um, you know, there are obviously a lot of important causes out there right now, but without having the healthy healthcare workers that take care of the people that fall ill, it was difficult for us to imagine any other issues being resolved. So we did a bunch of research and then we reached out to Get Us PPE and launched the GoFundMe charity page directly with them at the beginning of April. They were a grassroots organization that was founded by physicians. And so really it, during this time of uncertainty, it made sense to us that we do everything that we can to empower and support them because really they're the ones that are figuring out how they can make sure all of our medical workers that are on the front line have the protection that they really desperately need. What's happening right now is so crazy and uncertain, but I think that rather than feeling like there's nothing that we can do, working on this fundraiser has been really inspiring for us because the people who are protecting us right now are so brave, and if there's anything that we can do to help them, it's so important. Obviously, every donation uh, is greatly appreciated because time is of the essence, and every second, every mask, uh, every glove makes a huge impact. Alex and Maya together have raised more than $31,000 to get doctors the protective gear they need. You can donate yourself at charity.gofundme.com forward slash get us PPE. Stay tuned next week for two all new episodes of Day by Day. Until then, stay safe. <laughs>